Hey guys, it's Libby and welcome back to some more auxiliary bard book club content. I'm gonna be continuing my Shakespeare and language mini series. Um, so last time we talked about roughly the first third of Shakespeare's plays. Today we're gonna be talking about the middle third, um, which is gonna be Merchant of Venice, Much Ado About Nothing, Merry Wives of Windsor. We already did the Henry plays last time. Uh, Julius Caesar, As You Like It, Twelfth Night, Hamlet, Twilight and Cressida, Othello, Measure for Measure, and All's Well That Ends Well. As a refresher, this is not a video about Shakespeare's use of the English language. This is a video about what languages the characters in Shakespeare's plays would actually have been speaking had they been real people. Um, so I'm not like implying that Shakespeare is trying to add any meaning to this because he usually doesn't focus on what his character's native languages are. Um, but I'm saying this is something that we as modern readers can bring to our interpretation. If you haven't seen part one already, I do recommend that you go watch that because I am going to be assuming some knowledge from that video in this one. Because we're starting off with an Italian play. Uh, we're starting off with The Merchant of Venice, a play that you'll be hearing more about, a lot more about, before too long, don't you worry. This play is clearly set in Venice, um, and I think because this is a city comedy, it's dealing with the issues of the emerging capitalist system, um, I think we should assume that it's taking place around Shakespeare's time, so like 15th century, if not second half of the 15th century, not 16th century. Venice does have its own dialect of Italian called Venetian in English, or Veneto in that language, um, and m the majority of the characters would be speaking this as their native language, except for the Jewish characters, Shylock, Jessica, and Tubal. Now, the, um, his, the linguistics of the Jewish diaspora are actually really fascinating, and I don't think we see this sort of phenomenon in any other language groups that I'm aware of. Um, so the Jews are ri originally from uh, the Levant, modern-day Israel sort of area, um, the, the Romans in this area has been invaded a lot. Um, the Romans invaded in the first century BCE and there were several uh, revolts by the Jews against the Romans, um, but after the Bar Kokhba revolt in the first century, um, they lost and a lot of Jews left. Um, some were like exported as slaves to other parts of the Roman Empire, some just didn't want to get killed. And different groups went to different regions in Europe, North Africa, and the Middle East. Um, they tended to retain a lot of their cultural identity because their religion didn't assimilate. You, couldn't, you can't syncretize Judaism because like its whole deal is that it's monotheistic. Um, so they couldn't like incorporate their religion into the Roman religion, like what happened with um, the Celts. So pretty much everywhere they went, they stayed in their own communities, but they still had a lot of interfacing with the communities that they moved into. Another thing about Judaism is that uh, technically all males are required to like study the um, um, Hebrew scriptures, um, which means you need to speak Hebrew. And Hebrew was also the language that they had been speaking in Israel or Judea. But in order to interact with the locals, you need to speak the local language. So for a lot of languages around the Mediterranean, there is the like standard version and then a Jewish dialect of that version. Um, that's what Yiddish is with German. That's what Ladino is with Spanish. Um, and there are also several Italian varieties. And after a couple of generations, these dialects of local the languages became the primary language for the Jewish communities and they and they still spoke Hebrew as a religious language but eventually Hebrew fully died out as a living spoken language so I couldn't find a name for the Jewish dialect of Veneto, but I'm fairly certain that there was one. Um, so this would be Venetian Italian spoken with some Hebrew words, especially for religious terms, um, as well as some alterations to the grammar to have it make more sense with, to someone who knows a Semitic language. I think in this play when the Jews are speaking to the Gentiles, they're actually speaking slightly different languages and I'm guessing that Shylock and Jessica would be trying to like tone down the elements of Jewish dialect when they're speaking to the Christians, but when the Jewish characters speak to each other, they're probably letting more of that dialect in. 
Next, we're staying in Italy, but moving sheer across the peninsula in Much Ado About Nothing, which is set in Messina, which is in Sicily. It's like the far northwest corner of Sicily, the part that's closest to the mainland. Um, now, Sicilian is a quite distinct dialect from the other Italian dialects. This makes sense because like people are on an island, a lot of interaction with each other, less interaction with Italian speakers on the mainland. Um, but um, Leonato, the like governor of Messina and his family are all speaking Sicilian, but a lot of the other characters are not from Sicily. Uh, so Claudio is from Florence and Benedict is from Padua. These are cities much further north in Italy. So their dialect is probably going to be fairly similar to each other, but quite different than what they're speaking in Sicily. Interestingly, this means that when Benedict and Beatrice are doing their war of words with each other, one of them is not working in their native language. Additionally, Don Pedro and presumably his brother Don John are from Aragon in Spain, so their native language is Aragonese. I think it's more likely that those two have learned Italian and are speaking it than that everybody else has learned Spanish or Aragonese and is speaking it, especially because we have some lower class characters like um, Ursula, Mariah, Verges, and Dogberry who uh, talk to the upper class characters and it's very unlikely that they would have learned a foreign language. Next we've got The Merry Wives of Windsor which is a play about Falstaff. Um, Falstaff is a character that Shakespeare created who appears in um, the Henry IV plays and Henry V, or he's mentioned in Henry V. Um, and we know that those are set in the second half of the 15th century. However, this play makes no mention of any of the historical events going on in the Henry plays. And I just really feel like it's set in Shakespeare's England. It just seems way more like late 16th century um, than late 15th century. So I am assuming that in this play, this is one of the few of Shakespeare's plays where we are actually hearing what the characters would have been saying precisely. The actual characters were saying these actual words. Um, it is not translated. Moving on to Julius Caesar. This one is interesting because we do have the actual words written by some of the characters in this play. So Julius Caesar was a writer. He wrote De Bello Gallico on the Gallic Wars and also possibly some other things, um, as well as Cicero was a writer. Um, some of the other characters may also have written things, but not ones that I had to read in my intermediate Latin course. So I don't know about them. All of the characters are speaking Latin as their native language. Um, it's also pretty certain that all of the characters, except for servants and possibly the women, also knew Greek in order to serve in the Roman government, which like pretty much the entire cast is senators, um, you had to know Greek as well. So primary language, Latin, secondary language, Greek. Um, and there is one interesting moment in this play um, when Caesar is murdered, spoiler alert, um, he speaks in Latin. He says, et tu Brute, and you Brutus, or even you Brutus. When we look at the plays from this angle of like what languages were the characters actually speaking, it seems kind of weird that like, wait, it, we sort of, uh, uh, the illusion is shattered that they have actually been speaking Latin the whole time when a character speaks Latin on the stage. Um, but, now I get to talk about the medieval and early modern concept of the hierarchy of languages. Um, so possibly starting with the fact that the Romans required all of their government officials to also speak Greek. Um, Greek was a prestige language. It's considered like very fancy. Um, it's the language of Homer and Plato. Eventually it's the language of the Bible. In medieval and Renaissance Europe, at least Eastern Europe, uh, no, Western Europe, actually I think because of Orthodox Christianity, it's probably also a prestige language in Eastern Europe. Um, uh, Greek is like the highest language. Underneath that, you've got Latin, and then you've got the vernacular. So whatever people are normally speaking, French, German, Italian, Spanish. And we do have reports, although please note that like historical accounts that were contemporary with the late Republic, early empire, Roman period are like notoriously biased, so we have no idea if this is actually true, but it was reported that Julius Caesar, when he was assassinated, said Caesu Brute, which is 
the Greek for etu brute, even you, Brutus. So Shakespeare is moving from the vernacular up one step to the Latin um, to show that Caesar was moving up one step from the Latin to the Greek. Next up, as you like it. Um, so this starts out in a court. I don't think we get identified what the court is. And then we pretty quickly move into the forest of Arden. Um, this has caused some people confusion because it's unclear if Shakespeare is referring to the English forest of Arden, which is near the town where he grew up, Stratford-upon-Avon. Um, or it could be referring to the Ardennes, which is a forest in northern France. A lot of the characters' names are extremely French um, in this uh, play, so I'm thinking that it's um, the Ardennes in France, which means everyone's speaking uh, the northern dialect of French, Languedoc. However, after the Norman Conquest, a lot of nobles, and we're mainly dealing with upper class people um, in England, had come, were, were Normans, and thus had French names. So if this is set before Shakespeare's time, um, we might expect to see this amount of French names, but if it's contemporaneous with Shakespeare, um, we are in France speaking Languedoc. Okay, next up, <laughs> Twelfth Night. This one gave me some trouble. In this play, Shakespeare gives us two place names, neither of which really make sense. First one we get is Illyria, which is the setting for the play. Um, so Illyria is not a contemporary term to Shakespeare. This is a term of antiquity. So like the ancient Greeks, the ancient Romans called this area on the uh, eastern side of the Adriatic, like modern day Croatia and Bosnia Herzegovina. Um, they called that area Illyria. Possibly all of the characters in this play are meant to be Romans. They do have extremely Italian names though. And you know, when you get up to like the northern bit of Illyria, you start like rounding the curve into Italy. But still, if we're in classical times, there is no Italy, there is only the Roman Empire. Um, if it is uh, contemporary with Shakespeare and people were sort of using the term Illyria like romantically, and like we in the modern day can still identify a place as Illyria. If I ended up in a country and I didn't know where I was and someone told me I was in Illyria, I would then know where I was. Um, however, if this is contemporary with Shakespeare, like that doesn't really make sense either because in the 16th century, this was an extremely volatile region. It was the border between um, the kingdom of Croatia, which was part of the Habsburg empire and the Ottoman empire, which had recently within the past hundred years, um, uh, conquered the Byzantine empire. So there was a lot of fighting in that area and none of that is mentioned in this play. <laughs> The other place we get is Messaline, which Viola and Sebastian identify as their homeland or their hometown. Um, Messaline is not the name of an actual place uh, ever, as far as we can tell. Um, it could be referring to Messina, the place in Sicily where Much Ado About Nothing is set, or it could be referring to Mytilene in Greece. Viola and Sebastian are both Italian names, so I think it would probably be more likely that they would be Italians from Sicily um, rather than Greeks, but you know, none of this makes sense, so why not make them Greek? So if we are post-antiquity, but pre Ottomans pre-fall of Constantinople, I think that the characters from Illyria, so everyone except Sebastian and Viola, should be speaking a form of a South Slavic, um, like a like a Yugoslavian, you know, what would become um, Yugoslavic. Uh, uh, but and Viola and Sebastian would not know this language. They are from Sicily. I don't know, I don't, Shakespeare was, <laughs> here's evidence in case you didn't have any already, uh, that Shakespeare was not writing his plays with the characters, native languages <laughs> in mind. This one has stumped me, but you know, I say let's translate it into Croatian. And now we will be moving on to the much simpler play, Hamlet. That may be the only time that sentence has been uttered in history.
Hamlet is set largely in Denmark, but it appears to be set in the Middle Ages and the original story was a 13th century story. So I think we're in Denmark in the Middle Ages, which means we're actually not speaking Danish. The language is still classified as Old Norse, which also means that Fortinbras of Norway is speaking the same language. They're both speaking Old Norse, just slightly different dialects. So Fortinbras doesn't have to work in a different language when he shows up at the end. Since we are dealing with the absolute upper echelons of Danish society at this point, um, I think it's fair to assume that people speak other languages. Um, Hamlet presumably speaks German because he is going to school in Wittenberg in Germany, in Sachsen-Anhalt. Um, so whatever the Sachsen-Anhalt dialect of German is. Um, Horatio probably also speaks that language. It's not totally clear if Horatio speaks Danish. Um, I, I don't... I don't think we get told that he is Danish and he knows Hamlet from school, so he may be German. And I kind of think it's funny if like for most of the play, Horatio just doesn't know what's going on. Um, Laertes also presumably speaks French because he goes to school in France. Um, and then Hamlet may also speak English um, because he's able to read the letter that um, Claudius has sent to the King of England, which would presumably be in English, especially if you want it to be something as important as like, kill these people, you don't want to leave that up, or kill this guy, uh, you don't want to leave that up to the translators on the other end, you want to make sure you have it right in your court. Then we've got Troilus and Cressida, which is a play about the Trojan War. So uh, we've got the Greeks, and the Trojans. The Greeks, uh, historians are like pretty comfortable identifying those people. Um, we're pretty sure that they would have been speaking like uh, an earlier form of Greek. So Trojan War, if it happened, probably happened in like uh, 1185 to 1175 BCE. That's the dates that are given. So like classical Athens is like sort of 485. Um, so we are many, many centuries before the bulk of Greek literature. So the Greeks aren't speaking the same language as Plato. We might identify that language as like Mycenaean, um, which is written in linear B, which is a different, uh, an unrelated writing system to the Greek alphabet, but the language is continuous. So the Greeks are speaking some sort of early form of Greek. The Trojans are a little bit trickier. So we don't we're not totally certain who the Trojans were, again, if they existed. Um, they are in the far western part of what is now Turkey, so they could be ethnically Greek, and thus they're also speaking Greek, um, but they could also be Hittites, um, which was the cultural group that was in most of Turkey um, in the Bronze Age. Hittite is a dead language and it doesn't have any living descendants, but it was a Proto-Indo-European language like Greek and like English. Um, so it's not completely different from uh, uh, what the Greeks are speaking, but I don't think it's mutually intelligible. If the Trojans are Hittites, I think it's safe to assume that all of the characters are bilingual because they never seem to have any difficulty talking to each other. Next up is Othello, subtitled The Moor of Venice. So once again, most of our characters are Venetian. They're speaking Veneto. This play is probably set in the 1570s, a couple of decades before it was written, because that's when Venice was at war with the Ottomans, and we see a battle between the Venetians and the Ottomans in this play. So most characters, Venetian. Cassio is from Florence, so he speaks a different dialect of Italian. Um, Othello also not originally from Venice. I and mean, one of the problems with interpreting this play is that um, based on my reading and research, it seems like Shakespeare didn't really know there was a difference between Northern Africans and West Africans. Um, because Othello like has some elements of both when he physically describes himself, it sounds more West African, but more refers to like what's now Morocco um, or the Maghreb. Um, Northern Africa Muslim religion. So because like the answer to this question doesn't exist, we can't answer what is Othello's native language. It could be a Berber language, it could be Arabic, um, or it could be one of the many, many West African languages. And then we've got one more non-Venetian. Bianca is presumably a Cypriot, um, 
right now, Cyprus has like a Greek community and a Turkish community. Um, she's presumably Greek because if she was Turkish, why would she be hanging out with the enemies of the Turks? I'm assuming she's a Greek Cypriot. Um, so her native language is Greek. Um, but I'm assuming when she's talking to the Venetian characters, she is speaking Veneto or whatever Italian dialect she has picked up. Penultimately is Measure for Measure, which is set in Vienna. Not, I was about to say Vienna, Austria. I don't think it's Austria at that time. I think Vienna is a, sort of an independent city at the time. Um, when Shakespeare was writing, I'm pretty sure it was part of the Habsburg Empire. I should have looked this up. So although the main characters tend to have quite Italian sounding names, I'm pretty sure all these people would have been speaking a dialect of German. And today we're gonna finish up with All's Well That Ends Well. Um, this is a sort of precursor to the very peripatetic romances that we're gonna see at the end of Shakespeare's career. So we have a bit of wandering around Western Europe in this play. So in this play, we've got three primary locations. First one is the court of Rusillian, where most of our characters are from, Helena, Bertram, the Countess, I believe Parolles, um, Lafou, and the Clown. And for much of medieval and early modern history, France, even when it became a unified country, did not have a unified language. That came with um, Louis XIV, who like was really focused on getting everyone in the country to speak the same dialect. Um, so you have a bunch of different dialects, which are divided into two major groups, Languedoc and Languedoc. You've heard me talk about these a little bit before. Um, so these are named, Langue means tongue or language, um, and it refers to how you say yes in the language. So these are both the children of Latin and Latin does not have a word for yes. There is no way to say yes in Latin. So in Latin, if someone asks you a question and you want to answer in the affirmative, you would say something like that, as in like that is true or that is the thing or that is what I like. And there's a couple different terms you can use to express that in Latin. Um, in Northern France, the one that got used was hoc ile, um, which got turned into oil, because <laughs> French is crazy. And in the South, it was just the word hoc, um, which got, the H got dropped and it turned into oc. So you have the languages where they say oil as yes, and the languages where they say oc as yes. That's what languedoc and languedoc means. Um, and actually there is a, a state or province, a département um, in France now called languedoc Roussillon. So Roussillon is identified with the Languedoc dialect. So all of our Roussillon characters, their native language, Languedoc. Um, the king is in Paris, so he and his court would be speaking Languedoc. Um, and because that is the prestige language, because that's where the king is, um, I think all of our uh, 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 Roussillon characters would also know the Languedoc dialect, except I like to imagine Paroles doesn't know what's going on. Then in the second half of the play, we move over to Florence. Um, so the characters there would be speaking the Florentine dialect of Italian. Um, and because they are lower class than Helena and Bertram, I think it's more likely that Helena and Bertram are speaking Italian, that Helena and Bertram are bilingual, than that these like random commoners are bilingual. That being said, I'm calling them bilingual, but languages are not discrete. It's not like at the border, especially in the Middle Ages um, or, or the Renaissance. It's not like at the border between France and Italy, like people stop speaking French and then start speaking Italian. We're working with a language continuum. So because uh, if, if you've heard um, Occitan, which is, or Provençal, which are some of the descendants, the modern descendants of the Languedoc dialects, um, they sound like either French Spanish or Italian Spanish, kind of like halfway in between. So Bertram and Helena's native French dialect is more similar to Italian than modern French. Um, so, and Florence is not too far south in Italy. So it's possible that if they, like even if Bertram and Helena weren't like hadn't officially studied Italian, um, they would still be able to sufficiently communicate with the Florentines. And that's it for today, everyone. I hope this has been interesting, if not even helpful. Uh, I will see you later on.